Thank you, Victor. Good morning, everybody. My name is Arjan Alp. Although after 36 years, people still have trouble with my name. So luckily, I have a good last name that everybody can remember. Um, I'm, I'm, as Victor mentioned, I'm at APS almost uh, uh, as the first postdoc of APS I joined. And uh, it's a great place. Many of you I know from the floor. So, um, as Victor mentioned, I'm, I'm pretty much uh, inclined on instrumentation side of things. But because of my background in solid state physics and material science, I'm also interested in many of the projects that you're interested in. So, actually, my talk is pretty much summarized in, in the first slide. I'm going to excite some nuclear, nuclear resonances with, the, with this big machine and then look at into decay either in the time domain or in the energy domain and try to understand magnetism and hyperfine interactions and valence and spin, things like that here, as well as things that are of interest to you like sound velocity uh, and other thermodynamic vibrational properties as well as uh, high stop fractionation. So this is basically what we do and I'm going to limit myself to this part of my work. So the idea of using a synchrotron to pump in Mesbar transition was presented first in 1974 by a guy called Stan Ruby. He was a scientist at Argonne. And Argonne's Mesbar work actually starts as early as 1959. So we have a very long tradition, almost coincident with the, the, the discovery of the Mesbar effect. In 1985, my advisor uh, in Germany, uh, Erich Gerdau, published a paper demonstrating that you can actually do this. So this was the idea, this was the first demonstration. And uh, in 1995, we published a paper to convert the nuclear resonance data into phonon density of states and separate you know, many, many, many phonon processes to generate a single phonon density of states. So with these three core papers, the studies started. And now, I think, at uh, four different facilities around the world, uh, ESRF, Petra, uh, Springate, and APS, um, uh, we are generating typically around 100 papers per year. And there's about now more than a few thousand papers actually in this field. So it's not a small field anymore. So I'm going to briefly talk about introduction and methodology, some isotopes of interest and what is the information content we have and some recent developments. Uh, I have about 100 slides, so if you get tired, please remember you still have more to go. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Victor Ezra scattering is one of the many techniques introduced in the last two decades with the advent of third generation sources. These techniques would not have been here actually flourishing without undulator based third generation sources. At the same time, many, many techniques are also developed. Nuclear resonance is not the only one. So if you are getting confused with things like IXS, XES, XRS, this is Raman, this is emission, this is resonant enough scattering, and so on. So you're not alone. I mean, many people get confused. Just realize that any one of these techniques is a lifetime study. Because to, to develop the instrumentation and to develop the science around it, really requires full dedication for a career. So at APS, we practice almost all of them except Compton scattering. For nuclear resonance scattering, we, we have options at sector 3, sector 16, and recently at sector 30 for 10. Momentum resolved in our X-ray scattering, we have three, two instruments, 3 and 30. Resonant in spectrometer also uh, converged at 27. Now there is a dedicated beam line for this purpose only. X-ray Raman is practiced in some of the beam lines you are participating, and same with the X-ray emission. All right. So APS is quite uh, rich in that sense. Unfortunately, Compton scattering didn't pick up in the United States, which is a mistake. So when we talk about nuclear resonance scattering, we're talking about two different things. The one that measures when the detectors are put on the side and measure the phonon excitation will give you something like phonon density of states from the initial part of this data. Uh, it will give you uh, isotope fractionation from the raw data. 
uh, it will give you valence and spin from the time the time resolved data and if you have phase transitions like alpha epsilon phase transition as you see here epsilon phase being non-magnetic is squeezed out when you when you increase the pressure one of the nice things you can do is that if you have two isotopes that are both mass bar active that can be pumped and you have optics for it you can actually get this is dysprosium iron 3 you can get the dysprosium density of states and the iron density of states separate from each other which means that if you put it under pressure you will realize that the two two lattices are more or less disconnected the, the response of the phonons to, to pressure uh, or volume change is quite different from each other this technique is always confused with this one because they are in this practice in the same beam line and usually people use one use the other as well so in this method you don't need to have a resonant isotope uh, this is what we call in x-ray scattering with high momentum resolution so we have an instrument that is quite big six meters here and ten meters here with about you know one and a half two millivolt resolution where you can actually measure phonon dispersions all right, by measuring the phonon excitation probabilities at different Q values, at different momentum transfer values. You can extract things like velocity of sound, Young modulus. If you have a good single crystal, you can do elasticity tensor, and then you can look at magnetoelastic coupling and things like that. So this is the technique I will not talk about today. I will limit myself to here only. All right. Any questions on this one? Okay. So, nuclear, res nuclear and resonance is a resonance method, which means that, ev like every other resonance method, is full of surprises. There are always things that, that you will find new and be, dis be, be, be amazed by. It. That is mostly due to the fact that around the narrow resonance energy, there is a large change in the index of refraction. And in, in our case, the widths of nuclear resonances are measured in nanoseconds or in nano EV. Right? They, are, they are just happen to be there. And the relationship is quite simple. It's uncertainty in the energy, is uncertainty in time, is connected with the Planck's constant. For example, iron 57, the nuclear lifetime is about 140 nanoseconds, which corresponds to about 4 nano EV or 4.5 nano EV. Europium resonance, for example, is 10 times faster and therefore 10 times broader. So there's an inverse relationship between energy and time connected by the Planck's constant. So if you look at the variation of uh, index of refraction for non-resonant and resonant portion, so the energy here is 14.4 keV. I'm looking at iron 57 response. So the index of refraction is pretty flat because it's away from the 7 kilovolt K absorption, right? So there's no change for the electronic part. But for the nuclear part, there's a strong resonance in the imaginary part of this, which is related to the imaginary part of the scattering. And that's given by this resonant term, right? When X goes to zero, X means the distance from resonance in units of energy. This number blows up and you get this very strong uh, dependence. And the, and the order of magnitude wise, it's about two orders of magnitude bigger. So all of a sudden, at the resonant energy, the material becomes about 250 electron thick, right, compared to 26 electron. So that kind of strong variation of index of refraction does not take place around the electronic resonances. However, we have to recognize that these resonant nuclei are not sitting in vacuum they are actually on in, a, in, in an environment with full of electrons so therefore when you scatter from such a complex uh, system the nuclei becomes your messenger and it will carry the information about valence spin magnetism atomic coordination uh, symmetry around the atomic uh, around the nuclear resonance and it will give you phonon information so what, is, what, I, what makes this technique really unique is that it's not only element selective, but it's also isotope selective. So if you dope, for example, if you have hemoglobin, where there are two iron sites, and if you put iron 57 into one versus the other one, you will be able to get information about either one of them at will, which is very unique because it's difficult to do that with other techniques like diffraction or exops. 
So the story of light as a wave and as a particle took about almost a millennium. Starting with the book of optics with al Hazen, it went up to all the way to Maxwell to unify this story. Right? So by this time, we realized that electromagnetic radiation and, and, and the rules of electromagnetic radiation were written down. In the next 100 years, the story of light changed and it became more of a quantum rather than uh, light or wave arguments. Right? So starting with Max Planck and Einstein, we developed the theory uh, and basically culminated with Dirac. And then discoveries started to come. Mesbar discovered its effect and Glauber talked about coherence. And from our perspective, of course, the key people were Stan Ruby and Eric Gerdau in Germany and, and Seishi Kikuta at, uh, in Japan, who actually developed the nuclear resonance technique. So there are many heroes of this uh, technique to, that we use today. I'm not going to go through their names, but maybe you will recognize some of them here. So if you look at in the, in the, lot, in the last 30 years, uh, since 1985, right, we have excited these nuclei with the synchrotron. Right? So all of these isotopes have been excited with the, using a synchrotron. At APS, we limited ourselves to five of them, which are shown in red. 83 krypton at 9.4 keV, iron 57, which you are familiar with, europium 151, tin 119, and dysprosium 161. So you will say, well, I'm interested in tellurium or antimony or nickel, all right? Why, why don't you excite those? Because this is a question that comes very often. So I say, we are limiting ourselves below 30 keV because that's where APS is excelled. Right? APS flux peaks around 20 keV and above 30 keV you will, you will get a hit. The recoil free fractions, this is the most bar fraction of the, of the uh, let, me, let me spend one minute there. When X-rays come in, they carry momentum. And because of the conservation of momentum, when it is absorbed by a nuclei, that nuclei is kicked. If the nuclei is bound in a solid, that kick cannot be absorbed randomly. It has to be absorbed by the entire lattice. And that's when you occupy a phonon mode. So Mesbar effect becomes phonon without no phonon excitation mode. And, and that's why this recoil free fraction is important to get the Mesbar signal. When we measure inelastic spectrum, we go away from the resonance energy to compensate for this, but if this recoil free fraction drops below 15%, harmonic approximation collapses and the data becomes difficult to evaluate. When you go to 60, 70 kilovolt range, this number becomes few percent, and that's why we don't use. Yes? Could you maybe say a few words about the experimental techniques that you're using? Experimental, me how, how we measure this? Yeah, I'm coming to that. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yes. So basically, the choices we made are most related to the fact that you have to have a strong science case in order to develop an isotope. Right? So just one more slide before I come to that. Uh, the size of these uh, circles determine how easy it is to use the method. Right? So we limited ourselves to below 30 keV. We also limit ourselves to very fast, like few nanosecond reactions, if they are faster than that. So this region is of interest, especially in Japan. The people are trying very hard to see these resonances. But we limited ourselves to these five for reasons that, that are related to developing a science program. And I think that's quite fine. Iron is a 3D element, very abundant in the Earth. Tin is semi-metal. Europium and dysprosium are rare earths. They can substitute it into many different uh, compounds, and krypton is a noble gas. So we feel like we have covered enough. Uh, when you when you try to do this in your lab, you also had a long uh, long story with Mesbar right here. You use a cobalt 57 source. Cobalt 57 in 270 day lifetime with an electron capture populates and converts into iron 57 and populates this level. 136 keV level is short-lived, it's about 8 nanosecond, all right? And then it decays 9% of the time into the ground state. So this is a mesh power transition with 136 keV, which is very difficult to observe. 
The remaining of the time, it decays into this 14.4 keV with 122 keV photon emitted. This 14.4 keV is what we use for Mesbar effect. But unfortunately, only 9% of this transition goes into directly into that. The remaining 91% goes into internal conversion or electron emission, all right? K fluorescence lines and electron emissions. So if you have a transition to the ground state at the relatively low energies, that makes a, a, a nuclear transition a much power transition. So we go through, I'm not going to spend too much time, but we spend a lot of time in nuclear tables trying to identify these and look at their properties. So it's like a long process. How do we do the measurement? That was the question. So when the photons come in at 14.4, they do, they do the things that you already know. It will do some Compton scattering. There will be some Rayleigh scattering. There will be some fluorescence. And there will be some photoelectrons and Auger electrons. And depending on your detector, you can observe any one of these. The pulse duration at APS is 60 picosecond. So all of these things occur within the first 60 picosecond. Some of the photons are absorbed by the nuclei if they are at the resonant energy. And now this nuclei will start to emit stochastically, which means that some of these photons will come out later. And when they come out at 14.4, they will repeat exactly what the previous 14.4 did. All right? So they will emit photons in different channels. So this we will call delayed products. At APS, we have bunch structure, which allows us to actually obs observe these photons. For example, in my, one of my favorite modes, which runs about two weeks per cycle, we put a single bunch, 16 milliamp to 20 milliamp into a single bunch, and then we have about 1.6 microsecond quiet time before we go into these eight septuplets. All right? So this is for iron, is an ideal time because it's about 10 lifetimes, more than that, actually, to observe. So if I put a fast detector with nanosecond time resolution, I see these seven, uh, eight septuplets here, separated by 1.6 microsecond. And here's that big bunch at 16 milliamp. And as you see, there are four detectors here. Three of them are on the side doing the phonon measurements. And one of them in the forward direction, which has some coherent oscillations. The sample was Fe3S4 at 7 GPA pressure in a diamond angle cell. All right. So this is to demonstrate that we can take data in both channels simultaneously. All right. So basically, the idea is to pump this level, as Stan Ruby suggested, and then let it decay the time constant being 97 nanosecond half-life. And when it decays, we're going to see this spectrum. Does that answer your question? Now, the optics for this is, of course, special. And I can say a few words about that later. But the idea is you pump it at, at this big bunch, and then you let it decay. The red lines that go through this are not uh, interpolation, it's actually the theory. Because the Hamiltonian between photon and uh, the nucleus is exact. We know it exactly, including polarization behavior as well as uh, magnetization behavior. So therefore, we can actually analyze this data quite well. This time, these fast beats, I will explain in a minute what it means and what we can learn from that. So if I have a single line, like, for example, iron in um, iron oxide, right? No magnetism, um, or in stainless steel, rather. This, this would be a good example. So if you take a mesh bar spectrum of a stainless steel or HCP iron, that's what you're going to see in the energy domain. If you take this in the time domain as it is in the synchrotron, you will see an exponential decay. And that will be just a single line, right, in the at logarithmic scale. If I have iron oxide, like FeO, where there is distortions around the iron atom, the, the, the oxygen coordinations are distorted, 
Then you're going to see a, a removal of the degeneracy of the three half level from one half level, and you will have two transitions which will beat coherently against each other. And in the energy domain, you will get a spectrum something like this. And in the time domain, you're going to be able to get a spectrum like this. So the beat pattern here is proportional to the distance between the two. The larger the distance, the faster the beats. Okay? If I go to a magnetic split sample like iron, for example, pure iron, then we will have these six transitions, and therefore you're going to get a complicated pattern like this, each one corresponding to one of these transitions, and in the time domain, it will be a complex spectrum like this. Sorry. All right? Is that, is that better now? So that's the information content with respect to many things that, that are in the forward direction. So uh, Ron was asking me today uh, whether uh, these transitions are sensitive to the magnetization direction. All right? So this was just for you, Ron. All right? <laughs> so here you see an iron foil. This is the polarization direction of the synchrotron beam, and this is the propagation direction of the synchrotron beam. If you make the field parallel to this, you will excite these four transitions. So obviously, I didn't make it parallel enough, so I have still some little left. But I will get a pattern like this. If, on the other hand, I rotate the magnetic field and make it perpendicular to it, I'm going to see only these two transitions, and I will get a nice pattern like this. If somebody in the audience asks me what this big beat is, I will answer it, but not now. So here is the experiment. I have a main monochromator, which we recently switched to silicon. Then we have a magical monochromator called high resolution monochromator, which cuts down from 1 EV to 1 milli EV. 1 milli EV. Then I use some KB. Kirkpatrick bias type reflective mirrors to focus the beam to 10 micron. This is where you put your diamond anvil cell or your sample. Right? You, you can then put a detector on the side to determine the phonon probabilities, which means you have to tune the energy, or you stay on resonance energy and collect spectrum in the time domain, which is called synchrotron spar spectroscopy. Right? So these two techniques differ in geometry in where you put the detector. And if you're doing this, you have to tune the monochromator plus minus few hundred milliev to collect the phonon spectrum. So in schematically, it's like this. You have the focusing mirrors and the monochromator. You have the diamonds here. The sample is here. We put two, these two detectors on the side, or three of them. Now, this we owe it to David Baum. Because in 1999, when David came uh, to talk to me about doing some measurements, I have never had any idea about what he was talking about. All right? I mean, I heard about high pressure people, but I didn't know how they do it or nothing like that. So David described me a program, and I said, you can take over my beamline for the next 25 years and still be not done with your program, because it was so comprehensive. All iron alloys, all the iron compounds, all the pressures, all the temperatures, and he was right. I mean, we still have not even touched a few percent of what he was proposing. So he quickly built us a panoramic cell, which actually accomplished to put these detectors very close to here. And we managed to start to get some data. In fact, we published a paper that's mostly cited these days. So what, what is it that we actually get? When we scan the energy around resonance energy, we, we do see the resonance. This is a logarithmic plot. All right? But we also see some side peaks. These are the things that you cannot see in the Mesbar lab. Because Mesbar lab, you're limited to, to here. The, the velocity shift that you give in your drive is so tiny, so that it's in the nano EV range, not in the milli EV range. All right? So you are six orders of magnitude. You have to go to kilometers per second type of speeds in order to observe these. So once we realize that this spectra is, is uh, uh, complicated with the multiphonon processes, we develop methods to convert this data into the next slide I will show. But before I do that, 
In the raw spectrum itself, there is information. All right? So Harry Lipkin, who, was, uh, who used to visit us from uh, Wiseman Institute every year for like 20 years, uh, came one summer in 1995 and asked me, what, what is it that we're doing? And I told him that we just measured a spectrum, something like this. So he went back to his office, and a few months later he came back and he said, I had calculated these in 1961, but now I'm calculating this. And he published a paper in 1995, calculating the force constant, demonstrating that the third moment of such distribution is related to the force constant. That was nice. We didn't pay too much attention to it. We, we encouraged him to publish it. And, and then Polyakov came up with this paper which demonstrated that the force constant is related to, is related to the isotope fractionation. And now many people come to measure this. All right? So you don't even have to evaluate the spectrum, you just have to measure the third moment. On the other hand, if you convert this into the density of states, then you're going to be able to get some nice things about you know, the Bayesian velocity, the by temperature, if you follow these peaks with the pressure, you can get mode Grunaizen constants. Uh, you can get the vibrational entropy. You can get the vibrational uh, 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 kinetic energy. So there are, there's a lot of information that is of interest to geophysicists in here. For example, Victor came around early 2000s, right, on the FEO and measured the non debi behavior, demonstrating its coupling to the magnetization. All right, around the the spin transition. If you are interested in bio, bio inorganically, we also measure phonon spectrum from a lot of uh, proteins and, and porphyrins and cubanes and you name it, lots of model compounds. And we measure phonons, optical modes with very high precision. And uh, if you have a single crystal, we can measure them in plane and out of plane, right? So we have huge selectivity. And, and this technique has been a boon to, to people who are in the vibration spectroscopy of molecules. So one third of our users come from this community. So David, as soon as he took the first data set, also demonstrated that if you know the density and bulk modulus, you can take the device sound velocity, which is extracted from the cube of the inversely proportional to the cube of the sound velocity, this curvature here. He demonstrated that by knowing these two, we can, we can decouple the compression and the shear velocities from each other. Right? So by, by which, is, which can be measured with the X-ray diffraction. So in our setup, we also have a built-in X-ray diffraction for that purpose. And, and some results which shows that this technique actually works quite well. Um, just one more slide to advertise the technique, which is not so obvious because many of you do Raman spectroscopy here and or infrared. So this technique has some advantages over them. One of them is that these low frequency modes cannot really be measured with Raman. I mean, these, these are going down to 100 inverse centimeter and below, right? Especially if, you are, if your sample is in a matrix, it's difficult to measure. So that's one advantage. There are no selection rules. Like in Raman technique, you have to generate a dipole moment to actually make the measurement. And that dipole has to involve the, the atom that you're interested in. Whereas in, a, in this case, for example, this peak here does not involve iron, and I can see that. Unlike these peak intensities, which are related to the strength of the dipole moment, these intensities are directly related to the displacement along the direction of the X-ray beam. So if you have done DFT calculations where you can actually get the mode, mode participation factors, you can directly compare to this data. Right? So there are some quantitative advantages, not only with, we measure with high precision the location of these uh, peaks, but also the intensities are calculable. And so therefore, a good model whatever the DFT model they are using, has to match both positions and intensities. Yes? I have another question. Uh, so if you do high pressure experiments, often you have like uh, preferred orientation. Yes. Non-hydrostaticity. And 
That's a very good point. Yes, in fact, we made those mistakes early on, but later on we learned this gas loading, and so you, you pay attention to hydrostatic conditions, all right? And, and indeed, if you have or a texture, you, your spectrum will be heavily uh, influenced by texture. I have another question. Uh, yes. So what are the, uh, the, the, the techniques, the times involved to get the spectrum and the sample size? Ah, required? so a spectrum like this, uh, if you use, we encourage people to use enriched iron, so 57 enriched. A good spectrum like this in a, in a protein, for example, or if you have an enzyme, it may take a day. If you have uh, pure iron, it may take maybe an hour or less. Right? So it de pretty much depends on the geometry. If you're in a diamond anvil cell with 1% iron in an FEO, MGO, that may take a day. But if you are measuring you know, an iron-rich sample, a few hours is enough. But definitely, it's not a very fast technique. In terms of uh, uh, forward scattering, uh, iron, if you put half micron iron, it's 10 minutes, you have, you have a good data. And we are developing a method that will reduce that to a few seconds, actually, maybe at the end of this year. And does sample size help? Uh, sample size, uh, we typically have about 10 micron, 15 micron beam. So if you have a 20, 25 micron sample, that's enough. So we're talking about nanograms. It can be a glass, it can be single crystal, it can be powder, we don't care. So as I mentioned, not all IXS are created equal. So just one slide I wanted to show so that it's clear in your mind. This method that I'm going to show you, which measures the phonon dispersion curves. This is actually, I'm cheating here because this is a beautiful, beautiful neutron data from uh, Minkiewicz and uh, at Brookhaven, all right? This is 1960s. We never repeated this data with our method because this is like really enormous amount of time to get this data. But what we measure with the nuclear resonance is the momentum integrated version of this, all right? So when you, when you integrate that, that's what you get. And, sorry. So the, Dispersion-free points where you cross the Brillouin zone boundaries correspond to these peaks. Right? So even, even if you don't make these measurements one by one and if you simply measure this very quickly, you can still get where the transverse and the optical modes hit the Brillouin, Brillouin zone boundaries. All right? So these are pretty good indicators of where the mode frequencies are at the zone boundary. To make these measurements, you have to build a, a special spectrometer, unlike the nuclear resonance measurements. All right. So this is the one at sector 30. This is a one-to-one -one simulation. Not a, a, this is actually from engineering drawings. So here's the sample. The photons come in and hit the sample. They travel six or nine meters to these analyzers. All right. There are nine of them. These are curved silicon analyzers making a Bragg diffraction at exactly 90 degrees. So the photons come back onto themselves, travel the same route back into these nine detectors that are here, right? Nine detectors that are here. Each one corresponding to a different Q point. And then when I want to make a travel around the Brillouin zone or try to get an expensive Fourier method, here is the Fourier transform, right? So we do each Q point separately. This instrument is both of them are sector 3 and sector 30. So when you visit APS, please stop by and we'll show it. So this one is a, the non-resonant method to give you the phonons, phonon dispersion curves. The other technique that I'm talking about today is phonon, uh, momentum integrated but element and I stop selective technique. So our program has really proliferated in the, in the last 15 years. It, its roots is in the nuclear physics and accelerator physics and optics, X-ray optics and coherent optics. So we developed many, many years of instrumentation and immediately it found response in chemistry, mineralogy, geology, biology, and every day we have newcomers like people who are studying dental materials in some animals, some enamel studies, we respond to their requests. 
So these slides, I find it difficult to go through, but just want to mention that we have a program in material science in geophysics, chemistry, and methodology. All right. So I'm going to show you a few results from the uh, pure iron under pressure round. Maybe you might want to stay a few minutes. I'll be back. Great. So you have studied uh, this. You, you're familiar with this diagram. This is uh, alpha iron to epsilon iron. This is the low end of the pressure temperature curve of iron. All right. So there are a few hundred papers written about this. So it's a difficult subject to get into. And the, the slope of this line is, is proportional to the um, change of entropy with volume. Uh, this is the closest Clapeyron equation, right? And uh, we are, we're, we're limiting ourselves at the moment to this region, even though people have studied up to here. Uh, Jennifer Jackson, for example, she went up to 2,000 and uh, to, to megabar and up to 4,000 to, to identify these melting points. So I, for this purpose today, I'm going to limit myself just to here. And uh, there are some papers about this. I mean, uh, Ron published a paper in Magnetism in Dense Hexagonal Iron, uh, Search for Magnetic Ordering in HCP Iron. Uh, Professor Nasu in Japan tried to identify this, and there are still papers coming out in this field. So we said we can do this, we can study it. The questions are, like, how wide is the pressure transition region? Is it temperature dependent? Are there, is there any internal magnetic field left in the epsilon iron? Is there, what, is the, what is the field change in alpha iron as a function of pressure? Any corpus splitting in the epsilon iron, which would indicate any deviation from the cubic symmetry, and so on. And why would I use Mesbar effect for this? Because of very high resolution and very clear signature of magnetism. So, here's the setup. This is at ambient pressure. I start with iron. You see, this, I'm using the hybrid mode, so I have very good signal for a long time. As I increase the pressure, I go into the transition region, and epsilon iron starts to form. The magnetism gets lost, and I end up with um, no magnetic signal. All right? So this is maybe a little, uh, or maybe I'll, I'll do this one more time for Ron. So this is the signal we start with Ron, all right? This is pure iron under, uh, under at ambient, and I'm going to increase the pressure and look at the time decay of this signal. When magnetism goes away, that line becomes a single line. All right? So here you can see a summary of this. This is at very low pressure. When we put it in, we increase the pressure. And you notice that there is a dynamic beat coming in. There is still one beat. And, and I, I, ask, I encourage you to ask, but nobody asked me what, it, what this line for. So I'm going to answer that question so that you can actually not get confused when you see it. When you have... Uh, magnetism, where these lines are split, the resonance is split into six parts. And so therefore, the sample is optically thin. When I have no magnetism, all the lines collapsed, so all resonances are now on one energy, and therefore the sample is quite thick. When the sample gets thick, I get these dynamic beats, which means that the the, the nuclei inside the sample forms an excitonic state, and when the excitons decay, they can decay in the forward direction as much as they can decay in the backward direction. And at some point, they cancel each other. And that's when we get these beats. Yes? The transition actually is at 30 GPA, and you still see magnetism at 50. Uh, okay. Where is the transition? So we studied that. All right? We took data at every pressure point and tried to fit the data to get the relative fractions of alpha iron and epsilon iron. So when I started, that's the spectrum. All right? When I increase the pressure at 15 GPA, 
I, see, I still see a significant portion, about half of the sample is still alpha iron. When I go to 15.7 GPA, epsilon iron starts to dominate, but still I'm talking about uh, here 10% iron. And when I go to high pressure like 22 GPA, it's all converted. This is at room temperature. So the question is, is this temperature dependent? So we repeated these measurements at four different temperatures. All right? This is 11 Kelvin. This is 600 Kelvin, the blue one. I couldn't even catch the intermediate states. It was so fast. Right? So I converted these into a plot like this. All right? So we were interested in measuring the slope of this line as well as the width of this line. And here it is. And uh, this is the change of the magnetic field at different temperatures as a function of pressure. And this is actually where the onset of the pressure is around uh, 14, 15 GPA, where the transition starts. And it ends depending on the temperature, where it ends. Right? So, so we made this diagram. This is the epsilon start. This is epsilon ends, and this width is temperature dependent. Right? This part we haven't studied yet, that's next. Right? We're going to try to determine this um, uh, epsilon point. Yes? Do you have to worry about No, because this is just coherent forward direction, no phonons. Yes. So when you do the reverse, so you fully transfer it to PCs uh, to uh, HCP. Yes. So you go to HCP full, and then you do the reversal. You will see that the equilibrium pressure is actually at 13 GPA. Um, and that is well well established. So well, uh, I'm going to study that. All right, because going back. Uh, I, I, I learned this in a, in, a negative, <laughs> in a difficult way. Pressure is not like changing the temperature. Temperature you dial and then your cryostat goes there. Pressure is not like that. It's a one-way street. You cannot come back in the middle of a transition because the system is not, I mean, the, the instrumentation is not really suitable for changing pressure at 0 0.1 GPA as you will. Even though we have a membrane cell and we have a we have tried to do it carefully. It's still difficult. So I saw many, many data points that are so different from each other on the reverse side. But I will try. Because Ram brought that point up also during our conversation. I will try. Right. So this is on the way up. This is the phase diagram on the way up. So if I compare to published data, this is what we are seeing on the way up. Right. On the way down, I'm pretty sure it will be less than that. And the question is, of course, what happens? And we haven't studied that yet. Now, what about magnetism? Right? Can we? What kind of changes actually can we see in the magnetism? So I just blow up the early part of the data to show that we are sensitive to magnetism because the positions of these lines depend on the internal field. Now, let me blow up a little bit more so that you can see it better. For example, at 190 nanosecond, at 1.8 GPA, when I go to 15.3, this is still alpha iron, by the way, because I'm still seeing the magnetic transitions, all right? You can see that there's a shift of about 5% going from here to here, which means that the magnetic field has been reduced by about 5%, all right? So alpha iron, before it transforms, also starts to lose its magnetism, but not as fast as you would think. Right? Just a few percent. So people have actually published papers on uh, pressure dependence of the Curie temperature, all right? and, and try to demonstrate that as in the pressure range that we are interested, which, is, which corresponds to this volume change, the magnetism changes about a few percent. Right? So it's relatively consistent with that, about 4%.
I'm going to skip this slide because this is related to the isomer shift, but I, I'm still not prepared to talk about that yet because I haven't really fully understood. So we have answered some of these questions, and we will continue to work on this problem. So it's not finished yet. Um, I told you 100 slides, but what time do I have? Another 10 minutes? Can you, can you survive another 10 minutes? Is that OK? Sure. Good. So there's always this impression that we only work with iron, but it is not true. So I'm going to give a few examples to dispel that myth. So this is uh, europium and this prosium we're going to study. The energy of the transition is 21 and 25. The line widths are quite different from iron. And uh, yeah, isotopic abundances wise, actually we are quite lucky because half of the europium is already good. So you don't have to enrich your samples. So people have studied this prosium and uh, it's, this is uh, centimeters per second, not millimeters per second. So this is huge. I mean, this, this uh, hyperfine field is in the 550 Tesla. Right? But about uh, almost 20 times as big as iron. Right? The internal fields are quite strong. We are only able to see the beating between these two lines because this, this beating would correspond to 0.3 nanosecond, and I don't have the detector to actually resolve those beats. But still, I can do some useful work. So together, in collaboration with uh, Stas uh, Snogeikin at uh, HPCAT, we developed a, a new cryostat that can do inelastic scattering by putting the detectors on the side. This is the diamond cell is sitting here. This is a flow cryostat. And uh, we can do forward scattering to get mesh bar information. And we have also, we can do diffraction at the same time. We have an online Raman system to measure the pressure. And we have a membrane cell so we don't have to warm up the cell. So this is something we actually offer to our users, and it's the only one in the world that has all these combined capabilities in one shot. Right? So here is how the data looks like. This is the iron nictite compound, iron, uh, europium iron to arsenic 2. This is europium uh, data. All right? uh, yeah, this is the... Uh, so at 24 GPA, at 9 Kelvin, europium becomes non-magnetic, which is which we, we see from the lack of these, uh, and these are actually conus fits. So we can make an uh, kind of a, 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 a equation that is dependent on Curie temperature and some exponent to understand this data. So you can see as a function of pressure, we are able to study the magnetism in Europium. Right? Now, since there is iron in it, we also study the magnetism in iron. Right? So what we find out is that in the superconducting state, for example, europium can still be magnetically ordered, but the iron layers are not. So this gives you a, a tool that you can study in a layered system what is the effect of superconductivity on the next layers. And we studied the uh, phonons, both on the europium and on the iron side. These are europium density of states at different pressures. This is iron density of states at different pressures. Dysprosium, pure metal, right? Dysprosium metal. A lot of data uh, taken at uh, over a period of time. Basically, we are studying, uh, as, as we increase the pressure, there is, uh, I'm sorry, temperature, we're trying to find out where this uh, phase diagram looks like, right? So these are the internal fields of dysprosium as a function of temperature at, given diff at different pressures. Right. So um, the reason I showed these is that there are things you can do if you, if you especially in the nictides, if you can put your rare earth atom and the iron atom in the right locations, you can actually get very detailed information about the phase diagram using just SMS. skip all of these all right um, just a few examples from other people's work uh, hidden carbon on earth this was published in uh, PNAS uh, about three years ago one one thing I, I must confess is that 
We publish a paper which says we swear that it's iron and iron-3 carbon. We did another publish, we swear that it's iron-7 carbon-3. Then we publish another paper, we swear that it's iron and silicon. So I'm like, someday somebody will really embarrass me saying that, but look, you also have said that. Unfortunately, that's the way it's going at the moment. So I'm not quite really happy when people bring a binary alloy combination, make a measurement, make a comparison and say, see, this is what's inside the earth. It seems like it's a little bit uh, overreach, and there are many of, of those papers around. So I'm going to skip all of that because you are the source of this information. Uh, just a few words on iron isotope fractionation. I'm actually quite happy with this work, unlike the other work, because uh, we had a very good collaboration with Nicholas Daufas at the University of Chicago. And they came in and in a few years, they, they actually put up a very good body of work in this field. So I'm actually quite happy with it. Uh, the idea was published by Polyakov, as I mentioned, in 2009. He took our data, digitized it, and demonstrated that as a function of temperature, this, this uh, ln beta, the fractionation factor, depends on the force constant. Right? So this is uh, one way to obtain it. The other way is to get the third moments. In that process, we realized that we were not taking good data. Because when you take third moments, you have to pay attention to background at high energies. Because that's what dominates the, the moments. So we learned how to take data up, up to plus minus 150 mEV reliably with very low background. So Earlier, there was some early confusion, but now I would say that measuring force constants and converting them into isotope fractionation scientifically is a sound method. Right? So it works quite well now. They also tried to determine this as a function of valence. Right? So, the, so the number of uh, different samples uh, uh, that came to my lab. We have a mesh power lab, so we can measure the 2 plus 3 plus ratio. And uh, these are you know, basalt and andesite and dacite and rhyolite with different buffers, you know, iron wustite buffers and a few other buffers, prepared at different conditions. We measure the mesh bar spectra, determine the plus 3 plus 2 content, and then make a correlation between iron 3 plus content and the force constant. And as you see, 3 plus iron has almost twice as much or at least 60% higher force constant. And since our resolution is few percent, we are actually quite sensitive to force counts, uh, the uh, valence on the effect of the iron isotope fractionation. So this work is going quite well. I'm actually quite happy with this. So, so basically we are using both techniques. We, we use the uh, mesh bar spectrum. We can do this in the time domain as well, which we did. And then we can do the f uh, measurements in the energy domain for the uh, phonon density of states. Uh, how much? How many people are actually interested in bioinorganic chemistry? Not too much, right? Probably. Can I skip this section? Is that okay? And I will show you the mesh bar microscope and meteorite work. Yeah. Um, just maybe one slide if I can activate this. Anyway, these yeah, these movies are here. Good. So one of the things we can do. Uh, and I'm quite happy with this development, actually. When I, when I first proposed the speed line in 1989, they told me that, well, you can only see iron. And I told them, I'm happy just to see iron. But it turns out that we can see a lot more. So what we're looking at here is a, a bio, bio, bio an organic model compound with iron bromine and iron, chlor iron chlorine as uh, some ligands. And, and we're measuring at different modes frequencies. Right? So if you go to here and do the DFT, you can actually form the force constant. When you diagonalize the force constant, the vectors tell you in which direction and how much the atoms will move. And it will do it for all of them if you want to calculate all of these properly. In other words, even though my information is coming from iron, the, the, the theory that matches this will give me information about all of the atoms around them, right? So that actually turned out to be a pleasant surprise for me because I really didn't expect. These are not random movies. These are actually DFT calculated 
eigenvectors and the movie is made out of them. But how do you see the modes where the iron's not moving at all? We don't. Okay, but in your picture there, I thought some of them. Oh, because the, the in order for uh, iron to move in that, picture. yes, in order for iron to move in that uh, mode, the rest of the atoms must do that because we have all the force information. Okay, but I mean, there are modes where that are both moving. Yes, I will not be able to tell you what, what atoms are doing if I don't, if I cannot verify that experimentally. All right, so, I'm sorry, I'm gonna skip all of these. So a couple years ago, actually in 2002, I think, one engineer, a retired engineer, came to my office and told me that he has a meteorite in his hand. It was this thing in his hand. And I said, how do you know it's a meteorite? He said he found it on his lawn and he thought the neighborhood kids played a prank on him so he was very upset. So he goes in and his cleaning lady came and he said, see what the, the, the kids did? And the cleaning lady said, no, this is a meteorite. And I'm saying, well, that's a very good source of information. I'm sure she has good reasons to say that. Well, it turns out she did. She actually had heard on the radio that the night before there was a meteorite shower. And so she figured that out. So I said, well, I can tell you in a day whether it's a meteorite or not. Really? I said, yeah, just, just let me take a small chip. I took a little screwdriver and chipped a little bit. And then I said, come back tomorrow. And I went to the lab and put it, set it up and run it. And you can see there's uh, iron, Camas iron nickel alloy, which has a slightly higher magnetic field than iron. And I can immediately see that this is Camasite with 340 kilograms internal field. And he came back the next day and I said, you have, a, you have a meteorite. The museum in Chicago was giving him $2,000. So he went back to the museum with my spectrum and got back $20,000. And I had like zero, nothing, <laughs> no commission. So I figured out that I have some powers, but I don't know how to translate them to money, which is like my life story, right? So, so I'm not really surprised with that. So somehow that got my interest. And a couple of years later, I went to uh, the museum in New York and talked to some of the, uh, these two guys uh, who are the curators there and convinced them to give me some meteorites. Right? So. I took them into my beam line, put them here, I put a detector in the front, and measured an iron iron image. Right? These are iron image of the same area that I look at with the optical microscope. Then I could go into an individual grain and take a time spectrum and easily identify the camasite from, you know, uh, olivine and I'm sorry, there's a mistake here. This is troilite, this is olivine, this is just mixed. And some iron oxide and some pyroxene. So while I was doing that, my colleague Tom Toller came and said, can you try to measure the inner spectrum? And I, I said, sure. So I put the detector on the side and measured the phonon spectrum. And then later on, I realized that now I have a powerful tool. I can go to an individual mineral, individual section, or individual grain in a meteorite, and determine its mineral content by looking at the hyperfine parameters, and determine its isotope fractionation. So that is, that is what we are doing now. We're working with uh, Smithsonian on the Chelyabinsk meteorite. And you can see I can, I can make, you know, not perfect images compared to other X-ray microscopes which are in the micron range, but I'm, I'm working towards a five micron practical scope. And I think we can offer that to, to users like you. And uh, of course, it's not the only thing you can look at. You can look at banded iron formations, so you can get a MESPAR spectrum and an INOS spectrum at different layers. And uh, I'm recently looking at Chelyabinsk, as I said, which is quite interesting. So, uh, before you go, is there enough information with respect to get uh, isotope fractionation for iron? Yes, in the, in the phonon spectrum, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. I think it's the only way to do that with no, with, with basically non-destructive way. All right. What's the precision of fine isotopes? What is the? Precision. Well, precision? Yeah. It's the precision of which you determine the force constant. All right. 
So that is at the moment few percent. She's the expert. I'm not. So, <laughs> I, I my job is to give her as good a f f number, a force constant number as possible, right? And that depends on pretty much on the statistics, on the count rate, how much time you want to spend, how careful you are in the experiment. So it's it's combination of things. Right? So just one one few words about the tin. Because I talked about europium, I talked about dysprosium, but tin is also quite interesting. We have the hottest tin bin line in the world by a factor of 10 to our next competitor. And so I highly encourage you, if you have tin-related problems, we are the place to come. So for example, this is a clot rate where you see uh, tin is in the cage, not inside the cage, but it's in the cage. So we can measure the elastic spectrum. And uh, another type of clot rate, uh, we can again, to demonstrate that we can do these things. So I want to stop here before you guys kick me out. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much, Arshan. So, questions, please. So, in your um, uh, BCP to HCP uh, transformation uh, figure, I mean, that's a typical you know, time transformation temperature diagram. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you get more narrower, if you go yeah. faster, it should get wider. So, I mean, can you, can you do that? Uh, typical TTT diagrams are milliseconds. This is like hours or well, days, can, maybe. So, I cannot wait that long, unfortunately. I mean, I agree with you. If I stay oh, another perfect. two hours, will it change? Yeah, but if you go shorter, it also uh, would change. Right. I mean, it should get broader if you go So, it, it may have... Be, it may be practical at about 500 or above, maybe. At room temperature, I, I really cannot wait days, because I think it will take days to change the, the, the percentage of each phase. Right? But I think maybe close to the triple point, you might be right, that there might be some measurable temperature dependence. Now, for future discussion, what pressure would be given for iron? Neo. Neo, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the other thing that will change the rate is uh, whether you have like non Right. Yeah. For, for very low temperatures, we use the helium. Right. For high temperatures, we use the helium. Okay. So, very low, you mean? Uh, 11 Kelvin. 11 Kelvin, yeah. Uh -huh. Wendley B is, by the way, is the hero of this work because she does all the sample loading, and without her, I, I cannot move my fingers. Okay. So, more questions, please. Yeah, yes. I asked that question to Nicola several times, I and mean, why don't we do temperature dependence? He's quite happy with one temperature because the formula that relates it to the others seems to be robust. But Polykov made the argument to me one time that if you're not looking at low temperature, then the anhormonicity actually does play a role. Uh, if the F factor, if the recoil free fractures are low, he's absolutely right. But in the iron oxides, we're talking about 60, 70, 80 percent at room temperature, and therefore it's irrelevant. Right? But if you are if you are working with weak uh, systems like uh, bioinorganic compounds or tin, for example, you have to go to low temperature. There's no doubt about that, because it's difficult to de decide to decouple two phonon and three phonon processes from the data. That is correct, but not for iron minerals. Iron compounds, it seems like. I have a related question. Yes. So if you're using harmonic approximation, how, you know, how precise is that? So do you have to do? Well, as I said, we, the, our guide is at the moment the recoil free fraction. Right? So when, when we cannot separate the elastic peaks separately from the others and uh, then we basically throw our hands, then it depends on the theorist. Instead of calculating the dense stop states, they calculate the phonon excitation so, so probability. Is that you mean low frequency, some low transverse modes? Yes, classic. Yeah, I mean, th th that's a limitation, I agree. And uh, to address that, we are actually pushing uh, something better than one millivolt resolution spectrometer, so we can get closer to the bottom. 
But uh, yeah, I mean, unharmonicity can come in any time. That's true. But I don't expect it to be an issue for most of the iron minerals we're looking at. Are you set up for high temperature also? We have a setup for high temperature, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, in fact, several setups, but uh, some of them belong to users and some of them. For example, Nicholas brings in uh, platinum wire and they put the sample in and they just put the current and they heat it up to 1000 degrees. So there are several setups. When when you stop by sometime, uh, I'll show you. Okay. More questions? If not, let's thank our speaker. Right, thank you. Yeah.